I distinctly remember when I was at school and my teacher was unhappy about something that didn't go as expected. The grades in the last test weren't good enough, the attention span too short, the class too loud, too impolite. And the teacher's voice roared through the classroom, and I felt guilty. Though the teacher certainly didn't mean me, I was an A student who always made sure to follow the rules, to pay attention, to be polite, at least to the teachers, and I felt guilty. I felt meant. I felt I needed to do better. And I'm still very susceptible to these kinds of pedagogical measures. If a car honks near me, it certainly means I've been doing something wrong. When a poli police car is driving by, I sit up a little straighter. It might be the German in me, but if there's someone who speaks with authority, I find it harder to doubt, question, or even contradict. If only Jesus had worn a uniform. <laughs> People would have listened much more to what he was saying. We might actually have been successful by now, 2,000 years later, in building the kingdom of God. But that's not how God works, and it's certainly not who Jesus is. In our gospel today, Jesus is not speaking from a stage to a raging crowd of chanting followers, telling him that following him makes them better humans in comparison to others. He's not looking down on them, not even from a mountaintop, which is where Matthew sets this scene, right? It's the Sermon on the Mount. Luke puts it all on a level plane. Among all those who came to see him, Jesus is standing amidst everyone. Those he just healed from diseases, those he just cured from unclean spirits, and those he had just chosen to be his closest followers, his disciples. And instead of shouting at them or preaching down on them, he looks them in the eyes. He, Jesus, sees them standing in front of him, surrounding him. Jesus, God, sees them as who they are, the fisherman, the tax collector, the outsider, the marginalized, the unimportant, the freedom fighter, the traitor, full of hope and yet doubtful, willing to make change happen but shiftless as to where and how to start. And to them, to the disciples, Jesus speaks. This is what being a disciple looks like. If you are poor, hungry, weeping, hated, you are blessed. Let me, let me stress this again, because that is often misunderstood. Jesus is talking about discipleship here. He's not presenting his socio-economic concept for the world. This is about what to expect when you become a disciple, what makes being a disciple easier, and what makes it harder. As baptized, as Jesus' disciples of today, the text speaks to us too. But I don't want to water this text down. I can't and I don't want to make us the recipients of the blessings by saying Jesus refers to the poor in spirit or the hungry for justice. There are Christians in the world who know what it is to be poor, to hunger, to weep, to be excluded, and to look for God for vindication. And I'm not one of them. I grew up and I live in a culture that describes blessings as health, education, an intact family, and materialistic prosperity. But I fear that this concept of being blessed is not what Jesus had in mind, looking at his chosen crew of poor, outcast, unemployed, and runaway disciples. They don't fulfill any of our modern-day blessings. 
The good news is we, the rich, the full, the laughing Christians, the ones with a good reputation, we are not excluded from the kingdom of God. But our way will be more difficult because having faith, relying on God, trusting, appears in some weird way to be more difficult if you're comfortable, full, and happy. We can't hear the message. We don't bother with, oh, oh does Jesus actually mean me? We don't accept the authority because Jesus' message is not a truth in our materialistically blessed culture. And I fear that this is a reason why we're still living in a world with so much injustice and pain. Maybe over the next week you can watch yourself with a critical eye and pay attention to when and what you call blessed in your life. Our God is the God of those who have nothing but God. That actually includes us too, even if our need of God is masked in part by our prosperity. In the end, we are naked. We are as naked as the poorest of the poor. Our possessions are not everlasting. And this is how God sees us, broken and naked, and still loves us. If we accept this truth and live into it, then we can call us blessed too. Following Jesus is countercultural. It means not being in authority, not hanging out with the cool kids, not having the newest, the shiniest. Following Jesus, being a disciple, means in the eyes of the world, you might look a little loony or you might be a weirdo. Like St. Francis, who left his comfortable life to live with and for the poor. And I want to end today's sermon with, with his prayer. So please let us pray. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there's hatred, let me sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there's doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there's darkness, light. Where there's sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, not to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it's in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it's in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen.